All right. So welcome to the mom room. Thanks for coming on. Thanks for having me. It's interesting that I'm talking to you today because yesterday, so I have a sinus infection right now. So yesterday I took Sinutab because I had a really busy day and it keeps me up all night. So I'm very tired right now. So I'm happy to happy to talk about it. And I, I kind of joke that sleep deprivation just kind of erodes at our like our soul, you know, just because it's so tough. Our bodies don't know how to deal with sleep deprivation. You know, we have no coping mechanisms. So yeah. I can probably tell you all the things you're experiencing right now. Yeah, it's a plus a sinus infection. So it's like, you know, double whammy. Um, so on social media, you are that sleep doc. I'm curious how you got started on social media. Like what? One day were you just like on TikTok and you were like, I can do that. And then you started? It started more than a decade ago, back when I started my Twitter, now X account. And my interest back then was mostly medical education. So when I went into medical school, I had an older sister that was also in medical training. So I had a mentor, somebody that I could kind of follow in the journey. And I told myself, gosh, it's got to be hard if you don't have anybody that's, that's with you. And so I said, I'm going to start on social media and start giving out medical education advice. And that's how it got started. But then as my career shifted towards sleep, my content has shifted towards sleep. When did you start TikTok? Uh, gosh, not that long ago. Uh, may maybe a year ago. Okay. And do you love it? Oh, I really enjoy it. I mean, it's, it's yeah. funny because it, it, I, I usually put my content on Instagram and TikTok and on Twitter. And every, every there's a different feel to every platform and different feedback. <laughs> and so the same content gets different, different responses. And so I'm learning a lot. In TikTok, I get to learn about a lot of the new lingo that the, the cool young kids are using. And so I, I get a little bit of a preview into that. Um, Instagram, I feel like the crowd is still very young, but a little bit older than the typical TikTok crowd. And so the responses yeah. may be a little bit different. I find Instagram to be more of a community, like, like the people that are going to see your content are on Instagram are people that follow you and are invested. Whereas TikTok, I can put something out and it will just go to like the wild, wild west. You know, I don't know who's seeing it. And it's usually people that don't want to see it. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm sure you get some interesting feedback from, from the viewership. Uh, yeah, yeah I, exactly. I agree with that. I, I, I can see that. Yeah, sometimes TikTok algorithm gets a hold of things. And I have no idea. You know, the first one that got popular ended up with like 3 million views. And I had like 400 users at that time. And like overnight, yeah. I had like 60,000 followers. And I'm like, what just happened? You know, what, what did yeah. TikTok just do? You know? And then it's like the pressure of like, well, damn, now people are watching. I got to <laughs> keep making content. That's right. Got to step up my game. That's right. So you teach courses, correct? Like you're a prof as well? Well, it's funny because in, in the academic world, we have different ranks. And so we come in as like medical instructor, then assistant professor, associate professor and professor. And even though mm -hmm. my title is now full professor, the teaching that I do is usually in the hospital for our residents that are learning how to become child neurologists. And so that's, okay. that's the extent of my kind of my, my formal kind of teaching. Yes, I, okay. I give lots of lectures. I give lectures to pediatricians and other child neurologists and even parents. Um, but I don't have to, I don't sit in a lecture room and lecture to medical students. Uh, right. Not that type of professor. So if people are wondering, because I, I feel like oftentimes the general public can be confused about what training somebody has. You know, I come from a psychology background. And so I know there's a lot of confusion between like psychology and psychiatry and what training people have. So can you kind of walk us through the training? Like you're a medical doctor and then you specialized in neurology. Like take us through that. I would, I would love to walk you through that. So uh, after medical school, you, we choose a residency. And so I did two years of general pediatrics training. So the foundation is in just general pediatrics. So I was a pediatrician first and foremost. And then when I went on to do three years of subspecialty training in child neurology, so I became a child neurologist. Uh, so after that total of five years, I went on to do a one-year fellowship specifically in sleep medicine, where we're learning about every type of sleep problem you could have. We're learning how to actually read polysomnography, aka sleep studies. Um, and so it's just a one-year focused on that. And then since I finished that fellowship, I've been on the faculty at Duke going on about 10, 10 years, uh, actually 11 years now. Uh, as as faculty here at Duke University. 
So for somebody like myself that is not familiar with what neurology is. So my husband is a urologist. Mm -hmm. Oftentimes we get pages at night that are meant for urologists. And I'm sure he gets some for neurologists. A hundred percent. Like sometimes his phone would ring and I'm like, oh, great. Like he's going to have to go in. And then he's like, oh no, it was for neurology. I'm like, oh, like that's opposite ends of the body. (laughs) My classic 2 a.m. page as a resident was, yeah, I just had bladder surgery. And I'm like, "Uh uh-uh, let me stop you there. You got, yeah. you got you got neurology, the wrong end of the, the body. We got we got to get yeah. you in the hands of neurology. That's right. Yeah. That's funny. So what is neurology? Yeah. So neurology is essentially dealing with the nervous system. Anything that affects the nervous system falls under neurology. So at a high level, it falls into the brain, the spinal cord, the peripheral nerves that come off of our spinal cord all the way out to the muscles. And so anything that affects that area typically falls into neurology. So our bread and butter is epilepsy. We see a lot of epilepsy in the child neurology world. Uh, We see children that have developmental challenges, difficulty with hitting their milestones. Uh, We see children that have genetic conditions that can affect the way that the nervous system develops from a structural standpoint or a functional standpoint. Uh, We have subspecialists in neurology that help with muscular dystrophy and things that affect the muscles. And so uh, things like migraine and headaches, movement disorders, uh, all that falls under child neurology. And so currently, what would you say you see the most like with regard to patients or so so now 90 plus percent of what i see in my clinic deals strictly with sleep disorders amongst children we have two okay. pediatric sleep specialists here at duke university for the entire institution and so my clinic is now filled with children that are having sleep challenges and and that can be broken down into a couple of different buckets for the main buckets are insomnia or challenges with falling and staying asleep, um, sleep apnea, which is actually much more common in children than we think. We see a lot of that in our clinic. Uh, and then I also see many patients that have narcolepsy, that have parasomnias, these things like sleepwalking, night terrors that occur at nighttime. I have a good number of children that have various spells at nighttime. We're trying to figure out, is this epilepsy or is this a sleep disorder? Uh, restless leg, all of that falls under sleep, sleep medicine. And what age would you say parents typically start to notice that something is off and they bring them in? From a, from a neurology standpoint or from a sleep standpoint? Because I'm trying to put myself in, in their shoes. And so if you have an infant that is having difficulty sleeping, oftentimes it's just, you know, oh, they're colicky or, sure, you know, it's like normal, you know, in a sense. So at what point do parents usually start to... Re- to realize like maybe something else is going on. Yeah, I will tell you that it's usually uh, somewhere around the middle of the first year of life that oftentimes, and it's usually between the the parent and the pediatrician where this is first addressed, where they're like, these are the challenges I'm having. Does this fall within kind of the normal range of what you'd expect for an otherwise healthy child? Or does this rise to the level of, we got to seek out a subspecialist to help? Um, I'll tell you that, you know, over time, I found that most pediatricians can typically handle some, you know, the bread and butter sleep challenges because they've had hopefully some level of training in these behavioral interventions to help with sleep. Uh, by the time they get to me, typically my the children that I see oftentimes have some other neurocognitive comorbidity. I see a lot of children that fall on the uh, autism spectrum. I see a lot of children that have other genetic challenges that affect the way that their brains have, have formed or function. And in which case we're using both behavioral strategies and sometimes needing to use uh, medication options as well for sleep. Uh, so usually the, the, by the time they get to me, they, there's usually some other issue. They're not otherwise kind of healthy. Early in my career, I was seeing a lot of children that were otherwise healthy and we were just dealing with the standard kind of behavioral interventions. But over time, I think the, the primary pediatricians have gotten a little bit more comfortable handling that role. And so speaking of sleep interventions, obviously a huge topic in parenting, which is usually black and white. And this is one of those pieces of content that if I put it out, it's going to go to the wrong audience, (laughs) which is sleep training. Yes. So again, I come from a psychology background. So I have done episodes with psychologists who are their expertise is more so in like the attachment bond between you know, parents and child. And because a lot of the time, people who are against sleep training are saying that it's causing like these long term 
you know, damaging things like to their child and it's affecting the attachment and so on and so forth. And so I loved that episode with my friend who's a psychologist that specializes in attachment because she kind of explained all of that, you know. And so as someone who is on the medical side of sleep, what are your thoughts in general about sleep training? Sure. So the first thing I always like to say is uh, no, no sleep specialist should ever tell you you have to sleep train uh, a child, right. you know. And I sometimes hear that argument. People are saying, yeah, I have to sleep train my child. Nobody should ever tell you that. That's a parenting decision. And, yeah. I, I, and I never tell any, anybody that. Why? Well, when it comes to the data that we have on sleep training, there are clear short and medium term benefits for sleep training, but we don't see any long term benefits. So that, that means that means so if you if you don't sleep train, are you destined to have a child that's not going to sleep the rest of their life? Well, no, the data doesn't show that. So that's why I don't come to you and say, oh, gosh, you have to sleep train your child for their well-being long term, because we don't have mm -hmm. data to indicate that it makes a difference long, long term. Uh, yeah. but, the, but the flip side of that is that if you are a parent that wants to sleep train, that are having challenges with sleep at home, that sleep has become an issue and the child is of the right age and the right health, et cetera, and you're approaching in the right way, nobody should tell you you can't sleep train because mm -hmm. the data is also very clear. There is a lot of debate out there in the social media world, and I get it. And this is a fun topic for people to debate and, and feel very strongly about. But for me, I just go to the data and I say, well, what does the data show? And the data actually shows there's no debate. There's no debate. Renee, there's like, yeah. there's, no, there's no debate. You know, if you talk to sleep specialists and you talk to pediatricians, there's no real debate here. It's, it's a safe, yeah. effective option if you are having sleep challenges. And so, so my, my main plea is to that mom out there that's super sleep deprived, that is overwhelmed by this experience of parenting. And she is being told all these things about you're going to be a par bad parent if you do this and if you do that. My plea to her is, Mama, you can, you can do this because it's safe, it's effective, and it's an option. Let me empower you with, an, with the options, and then you can decide what's best for you and your family. You know, that's mm -hmm. it. Yeah, I am like, we didn't sleep train until Milo was probably, a, no, not, no, 11 months old or nine months. Anyways, much later than people typically do. And I still am an advocate for, you know, if you're struggling, that is an option. And like you were saying, nobody's saying you have to sleep train. If it's not a problem for you, then it's not a problem. And for us, it wasn't a problem until much later on, you know, then we had to do something about it. But people... <sighs> It's one of those topics in parenting that is extremely black and white. Like people feel so strongly. And like you were saying, even though the data, like there's nothing to, to show that this is damaging long term. But yet there's an entire group of people, I would argue like it's almost like 50-50 who will come at you saying like it's absolutely terrible. And it's it's same with like so many things in parenting, but this is one of the big ones, you know, and I, I do feel for moms and parents who are struggling with that, who then feel guilty and almost like shame yes. to go the sleep training route. And also, our society is so focused on baby and not focused on the parents, especially, you know, if mom is the one feeding all night and you know, having sleep deprivation. Nobody is looking at the effects of, you know, mom being depressed, uh, sleep deprived, unable to interact with her baby during the day as she would like to, because she's so sleep deprived. Like, what are those effects on yes. the relationship? You know, it's so focused on, like, it's very baby centric. Well, let me just touch on that, because this, this is a really important point you've brought up. There is this notion that the more as a parent you sacrifice and, and, and hurt yourself and your own well-being, that you're somehow doing it for the benefit of your child. I will tell you that I'm a pediatric sleep medicine physician. You know, my focus is on the child. And so when I give these recommendations, I'm doing it for the child's sleep, knowing full well that the parent may benefit, 
but it's not for the parent per se. Mm -hmm. I'm doing it for the child's sleep continuity and for the child's well-being. Um, so that's, that's number one. But number two, you're absolutely right in that a parent's well-being and a parent's mood and a parent's attention and focus and sleepiness level directly impacts the health and the well-being of their child. And so if a parent isn't sleeping, that's a bad situation for everybody. You know, parents are behind the wheel driving their car, their, their, their babies around to various appointments, right? Um, their level of stress can impact their ability and willingness to, to breastfeed, for example. And so we know that a well-rested mother that has the support that she needs uh, is, uh, is, is in everyone's best interest, including the child. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I feel like oftentimes, like I can understand people's point of view from, you know, it's you know, like being close to your child all night and they cry and you like cuddle them. Like I get that. But at the same time, I feel like our world is not set up to support parents in that way. So what's the next best option? And how can we overall like reduce harm and get people to have a good night's sleep? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, I agree the, the 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 home and the family has morphed over over centuries, right? And, and certainly over decades where we are a smaller entity now where a lot of the the burden of early uh, child care falls uh, unfortunately, oftentimes on, on, on the mother, unfairly. Mm -hmm. And there's lack of you know, extended family that can oftentimes come in and help support when you know, children are you know, awake throughout the night, etc. So it becomes a very, very challenging environment in which to raise a child. And again, yeah. the goal here is, well, let's, let's empower you with things that we know are safe and effective. And so some of the arguments I receive is, well, well, this is just a very, you know, this is a very Western thing. And this is not how, you know, we've been doing it for centuries and centuries. And I kind of push back and say, well, there are a lot of Western things that we do that I think we should be proud of, right? I mean, our, yeah. our, when it comes to our, you know, when it comes to safety for children, when it comes to, you know, car seats and, and use of car seats, that's, you could argue that's kind of a Western thing, but nobody kind of says, oh, that's just, nobody else does that in other, you know, countries. Well, you know, th these are, these are important for the safety of the child. And just because it's been done a different way for many, many years or centuries or when we were ca cavemen and women, doesn't mean that it's the right thing now. You know, we we, yeah. we we change over time based on the needs of our society and of our children and, you know, vaccines we weren't doing when we were cave people. And that's something that I would think is, is a positive thing. So just because it's been done one way for centuries doesn't mean that it's necessarily a bad thing that we're doing it differently now. Yeah. So you are a sleep doctor. So this is my question that I love this topic, the topic of melatonin. Yes. Um, what are your, so I never thought anything of melatonin and I feel like most people in the world, like we're not very educated on hormones. And so I didn't even realize that it's a hormone to be quite honest. <laughs> like I'm almost 40 years old, mm -hmm. <laughs> had no idea. Um, and it's marketed. So I heard an episode, do you know, Dr. Huberman, the yes, Huberman lab podcast? Course. So mm -hmm. yeah, I listened to his episode on sleep and I was shocked when he was talking about melatonin and how it can like disrupt well first of all that it's a hormone it can disrupt like puberty and all kinds of things I was shocked because it's marketed as something that you give to kids and it's a hormone so that it's just shocking like so what are your thoughts on melatonin whether or not parents should be using it and I'll be honest, we use it every now and then. Um, we just used it the other night because he was up, my in-laws were visiting. So he was up super late on the weekend, visiting with them, and then sleeping in in the morning. And then he had school on Monday. So usually when we're in that situation, I know he's not going to be able to fall asleep for a long time. So I'll give him his melatonin and it works like a charm. He goes to bed, everything's fine. But I'm always like, in the back of my mind, I'm like, I don't know if I should be giving him this. So what are your thoughts on yeah, melatonin? There, there's so much to unpack with melatonin. I guess to start off at a 10,000 foot level, when it comes to what's out there in, 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 in these bottles, these melatonin supplements, the FDA unfortunately does not regulate melatonin. And so there, what's on the shelf can be very different. You know, what, what it's labeled as can be very different than what's actually in it. And there have been multiple studies that show that 
what they what they label the melatonin as. Some bottles have zero melatonin in them. Some have additional additives like serotonin, um, you know, cannabidiol, like all sorts of weird things that can end up in melatonin bottles. And because again, it's not FDA regulated. So, you know, step number one is well, let's make sure we're, you're, you're using something reliable. And two, you know, this is a conversation usually between you and the pediatrician. So I say, if your pediatrician has recommended it to you for whatever reason, that's fine. I'm not going to get in the way of that. But I will tell you that one of the biases when it comes to pediatrics world, if you're pushing towards melatonin in an otherwise healthy child that has a behavioral sleep issue, it's more of a, it's more of a band-aid as opposed to getting to the root of the behavioral cause. And, and we know that the behavioral causes are the most common for really young children. We're talking older infants and toddlers. It's usually either what we call sleep onset associations or limit setting issues for otherwise healthy infants and toddlers. I would say 95 plus percent of sleep issues fall under that category. So, so if, if it's a behavioral sleep issue, my plea for, to pediatricians and families out there is, well, let's work on the behavioral interventions whenever we can. Melatonin does have data to support it as more of a clock, a biological clock shifting supplement. So what, what does that mean? Well, if you have, if your circadian rhythm is misaligned, whether you're traveling and you have jet lag, whether you're like a teenager that has a really delayed body clock, whether you're a shift worker, there is data to indicate that melatonin can be helpful in those situations. That's where the data actually supports it. But it's not a great, quote unquote, sleep aid. And the reason is because by, by the nature of this hormone, it's meant to be what we call like the sleepy hormone, the, the, the dark hormone. So it, when it's dark outside, your brain starts secreting it. And it tells your brain, hey, it's dark. As an, as an entity, you should start doing what you do when it's dark outside. And for human beings, that's we get sleepy. But interestingly, nocturnal animals that are awake all night, they also make melatonin at night. And for their brains, it's the opposite. When, when they have melatonin, they're like, ah, now it's time for me to be awake. So the substance itself doesn't have huge sleep-inducing properties. It's mostly telling your brain, hey, it's dark outside. Do what you should do when it's, when it's dark. And it's good for shifting that body clock. So I guess the bottom line is, be wary of using melatonin as kind of a Band-Aid. Um, and, and if it's a behavioral issue, let's use the behavioral interventions to help your child. And so with regard to supplements, like I know for adults, there's lots of talk about magnesium now and how that can be beneficial and a lot of people are deficient in it. Are there any other supplements that would be beneficial for children? I, I, will, I will say I recommend almost none like ever okay. <laughs> for children, you know, uh, and, and even, even when it comes to magnesium, you know, although it's be become kind of the latest thing that people have kind of turned to, uh, I won't argue with success. If it's helping you, I rarely argue with success. And I say, that's great. But when it comes to true magnesium deficiency, if you're, if you're eating a kind of a well-balanced diet in, for us here in the Western culture, it's very hard to be ma truly magnesium deficient. You know, like it's, it's one of the, when, whenever I, uh, we're checking labs, like routine labs on a child, it's rare, it's, it's rare that I'll ever see a low magnesium level just because it's in lots of different foods and you tend to, yeah. Why on TikTok is everybody like 95% of the population yeah. is like magnesium deficient? Like what, what is going on? This is one of those fun things to talk about. You know, it's, it's kind of the latest thing. Like everybody should be on magnesium. It's uh, magnesium is good if you're constipated. It helps things kind of move yeah. through your, your gut. Um, there's, I think there's increasing information regarding magnesium and maybe a restless leg tie, but the data is not strong enough that I, I, I never recommend magnesium to my patients as a first line for for anything, uh, except there's some data from for migraine. There's some data for magnesium oxide in, in migraine, um, and of course it will help with constipation just because it helps push things through. So, um, so that's that's my take on magnesium and supplements in general. I love it. Yeah, you're very similar to my husband. Like I'm like a supplement. Like I have a problem. Like, but I maybe I need to like. Maybe I need to like hang around more people like you and stop consuming that kind of content because I'm always like, oh my God, like I want to take this. And my husband's like, here we go again. Like we're spending all this money on supplements. And like, that's so me. I'm like a supplement yeah. junkie. P people in the supplement world will convince you're deficient in everything. And 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 again, you know, for <laughs> for centuries, we've been fine, you know, without all these amazing yeah. supplements. Uh, you know, again, well-balanced diet, even vitamins. So you could, people would argue that do you really even need a multivitamin, you know, because because your body usually can get what it needs through your regular diet. Okay, well, let's talk about why mom can't sleep well after having a baby, but dad can sleep just fine. Huh. Well, I will start off by saying there's an interesting study that shows 
what do people wake up to? What noise are you most likely to wake up to if it's plays at, played at the same kind of decibel level? And surprise, surprise, women are more likely to wake up to the cry of a child. And I, don't, I, I forget where that ranked for, 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 for fathers, but the, they're more, most likely to wake up to a car, a car alarm going off. <laughs> mm. when it comes to the range of different different sounds that's so hilarious there's there's likely something something just with our our natural makeup you know um with the way that our brains are wired that makes moms more responsive to the cries of a child so there could be just something biological there um i will tell you that moms likely can't and, and again i I, I, I could tell you what, you know, I have experience with, with my wife when it comes to childbirth and all the things that, you know, there's so much that's changing from, for, for mothers that, you know, for dads, you just, it's, it's just life is just a lot easier in this way, you know, and it's very important. Mm -hmm. It's very unfair, but mom's body is changing. Mom becomes, oftentimes becomes a source of nutrition and comfort and support and nighttime support. And, you know, depending on the dynamic between, you know, if it's a, if it's a heterosexual couple, depending on the dynamic between who's working and who's not, mothers unfairly oftentimes have to end up sacrificing a lot. And, mm -hmm. and that leads to uh, many issues, but of course leads to sleep deprivation along the way. And many moms yeah. will argue that I've never been able to get a good night of sleep, even though my child are now older and they're sleeping well, I still can't get a good night of sleep. And you know, things changed ever since I became a mom. I think that's a very real thing. And, um, and, yeah. it's, and it's a problem. It's interesting because. I realized very early on that I had a really hard time sleeping with the monitor because of that reason. If there was a little sound from Milo, I would be wide awake. I couldn't fall back asleep. I'm waiting to hear the next sound. It was like a whole thing. And so we ended up when he started sleeping by himself in his nursery, my husband would sleep with the monitor and I would sleep in the guest room. And he would get up with him and like quickly feed him. And my husband could fall back asleep instantly and would only wake up if it was like a full blown cry, you know. So that's kind of what worked for us. And probably the reason that my husband doesn't want to have another kid because <laughs> he was getting up with him for so long. And yeah, and even now, like last night, perfect example, two in the morning, Milo is yelling, dad, dad. and of course, I'm the one that heard it and went and got him. He had to go pee. And I'm like, how do you not hear that? But yeah, are some people just like, are some people just like better at sleeping than others just I, yeah, in general? I, th I think the depth of sleep probably varies. You know, some people can can sleep very well and help tune out external noises. It's funny because my wife would say the exact same thing. Like, how did you not hear you know, the, the child. And I'm like, I, I'm sorry. I, I, you know, I didn't even, didn't even wake up, you know? Uh, so yeah, I think, I think different people have different levels of depth of sleep and are more likely to be alerted in certain situations. Um, and then again, you know, that biological fact we talked about, I'm, I, I'm sure there's something to it when it comes to mom's ability to, to tune into an infant cry. And there's likely something yeah. that's very protective about that and evolutionarily conserved, you know, that moms can, can be so in tune with their children, but it leads to sleep challenges for sure. So as a sleep doctor, doctor, would you say that you sleep really well? Are you a good sleeper? I consider myself a sleep expert and an expert sleeper, you know. Amazing. And so I, I do sleep very well. I've always been able to sleep very well. So I like to say it's all the things that I've learned to do for my sleep. But I think I'm also just programmed genetically to have a pretty good sleep drive. You know, I can fall asleep pretty quickly. And, and whenever it demands of me, my, my brain tends to quiet down quickly. Uh, and I know that that's not something that I may have necessarily done to achieve that. It's, it's, I've been blessed, I think, with the, likely the, the brain wiring to achieve that. That's probably 80%. Yeah. Did you and do you currently spend a lot of time being on call? I, when we're, whenever we're covering the hospital, we're on call for a week at a time. And so our okay. residents that are, that are covering patients can call us at any point throughout the night. Yeah, that's, that's why I... Like, that's what I attributed my husband's amazing ability to get up, feed Milo and instantly fall back asleep was because he's used to being on call and getting up, you know, addressing something, falling right back asleep. Yeah, I, I, I it's funny because we talk about insomnia, you know, oftentimes residency is a, is a cure for insomnia because you end up kind of being so sleep deprived 
that when things occur at nighttime, you one, you fall asleep quickly, and then two, when things come up at night, oftentimes you're able to fall back asleep because you're so sleep deprived. Um, there's a lot of lot of issues there too, you know, being being a sleep deprived resident and the, the care <laughs> that you provide, and there's lots of data and research into that, which is probably a little bit you know off off the path of what we want to talk about. But but yes, I think a lot of medical trainees end up you know becoming prone to being able to fall back asleep quickly. <laughs> Okay, but this is interesting because I'm pretty sure there's rules about sleep for like truck drivers. You know, you have to like sleep a certain amount or even like airplane pilots, let's say. There's all these rules about sleep and how much you can work and like in a length of time. But a surgeon could be on call and be in the hospital all day, all night, and then operate the next day. Uh, that, correct. Yes. So once you, there are rules around residency, so there's now strict rules regarding 80 hour work weeks um, for, for residents. And again, that's kind of in flux, but they, they limit it to 80 hours per week, which is still a lot of time, you know, double the standard work week. Uh, but you're right. Mm-hmm. Once you're out of the residency period, then you are you're no longer protected by those rules. And so if you are a physician that's on call, the surgeons in particular, yes. Yeah, you could be operating all night and then all, all day the next day. It kind of leads, leads to mind, interesting yeah. questions, right? It's like, should you be able to ask your surgeon, are you a morning person or a more of a night person when it comes to timing of your surgery, right? Should you be able to ask your pilot how many hours did you sleep last night? Because that directly impacts kind of your, your safety. And you mentioned mm-hmm. pilots. Although I've been shocked at how many pilots have reached out to me on social media to be like, how do I deal with kind of jet lag? I'm like, this is the FAA. You know, don't you guys have training on this? You know, like the flying planes and you're always shifting, you know, time zones. Isn't there some sort of a formal metric in place? Maybe there is. And the ones that reach out to me don't, aren't aware of it. But I've been shocked. They've been like, help me manage my jet lag. I'm like, I never even planes. thought of that. You know, you're flying planes. I hope someone's taught you this. <laughs> I never even thought of this. that. Yeah. Yeah. It's kind of amazing. Oh my gosh. Um, yeah. So for a sleep study, can you just explain what that is and yeah. what you guys are looking at? Absolutely. So a sleep study, the formal term is polysomnography. And what we do is for children, typically we bring it into a sleep lab. In most places, it looks like a hotel room or like a nicely, you know, a kid-friendly room. A parent stays with the child. And we have lots of wires hooked up the child. We're trying, to, we're trying to look at a variety of bodily processes. One, we have wires on the brain. That's an EEG, an electroencephalogram to see what the brain waves are doing, what stages of sleep you're in, et cetera. We have EMGs, electromyogram to look at what, what we're doing with muscle activity because the different stages of sleep, your muscle activity drops. We have EKG on the heart. We have, we have bands that go around the chest and the abdomen to see if you're making an effort to breathe. It actually detects how much you're moving and how much you're expanding your chest and your abdomen. And then we have little, what we call flow leads that sit under the nose and right next to the mouth to see how much air you're moving. Because the main goal of a sleep study is, to, is usually to look for sleep apnea, just to look for breathing challenges while you're asleep, and to rule out other issues with sleep quality that could be contributing to excessive daytime sleepiness, for example. So if we're, if we're working out the patient that might have narcolepsy, we'll send them for a sleep study to make sure there's no signs of sleep apnea. And then we do some other specialized studies the next day to help diagnose that. But the main reason is really to look for, for breathing. It can also be helpful to look for leg movements, periodic limb movements mm. of sleep, which people that experience restless leg often have limb movements throughout the night that can be disrupting sleep. So that's where it's really helpful. It's not a great test for insomnia. So people say, gosh, I can't sleep. Should I get a sleep study? Well, if you have trouble initiating sleep, what's going to happen? Well, you're going to come to the sleep lab. We're just going to see you awake for a good number of time. And we're not going to really know why unless we ask you the questions that help us get to the bottom of what's causing your insomnia. So insomnia evaluations are more just discussion between the physician or the, or the sleep specialist and the patient. A sleep study is really looking at breathing and these abnormal movements throughout sleep, looking at the sleep quality. What would you say is like a, a major lifestyle factor or something that contributes to insomnia in maybe kids, but also like adults? Yeah. So, so the classic form of insomnia used to fall in, under a subtype that we called psychophysiological insomnia. And that's, that's a long word that just means usually the, the bedroom has become the place where you think and worry, not the place where you sleep. And the, the theories behind this is that there are folks that are naturally predisposed to having insomnia tendencies. And then you have perhaps an inciting event or inciting circumstance. And then that kind of perpetuates and causes you to have persistent insomnia. Uh, but it's usually this, this internal sensation of, you know, instead of relaxation, 
laying down in bed becomes activating. It becomes, you know, anxiety provoking. It becomes like this battle inside your head where you're constantly thinking, just go to sleep. Why can't I sleep? Ah, if I don't sleep, this terrible thing's going to happen the next day. And it becomes kind of a vicious cycle. That's like a classic form of insomnia that most adults and some teenagers will experience. Do people with insomnia have an okay time napping during the day? Um, the, napping can also be a challenge, but I'll tell you that if you're out of your sleep environment, which oftentimes the environment itself is what's causing some anxiety, and then if you're laying around on the, in, the, in the couch and you don't have that pressure to fall asleep, sometimes not being in the environment where you feel that pressure to fall asleep naturally helps you sleep. Some people say, when I go to a hotel, I sleep just fine because you're out of that environment that tends to be anxiety provoking. And so, yes, some people can nap, but sometimes, you know, insomniacs just across the board have a hard time winding their brain down and falling asleep, whether it's for naps or, you know, sleeping in other locations as well. What's your thoughts on sound machines? Yeah, there's a lot to talk about when it comes to sound machines. Uh, for me, you know, we talk about, when we talk about like sleep training, we talk about sleep onset associations, which is anything that you associate with the process of falling asleep. And, you know, for, for adults, that could be, for example, I have to have a TV on to fall asleep at night. The challenge with having something on that helps you fall asleep is that you are going to wake up at nighttime. Nighttime awakenings are totally normal. Every human being wakes up multiple times at night. So you should not consider an awakening a failure. But the issue here is if you have a TV on every night to help you fall asleep and you go to sleep with that in, in place, your brain learns, ah. I go from wake to sleep with that in, in, in that in my environment. So when you wake up at night and the TV's off, it's going to be a little bit harder to, for you to fall asleep. Now with sound machines, it's a little bit different because you can play them all night long, right? And so I usually say, if you have to have something on that's helping you fall asleep, make sure it's something that's steady, that's there the entire night. So that could be like a box fan or, or, the, or the fan overhead, or it could be a white noise machine. But for children and for adults, we have to be very careful about the level of sound that we're getting. Because, you know, OSHA sets the guidelines for workplace safety when it comes to the level of sound you should hear. The higher the decibel level you're getting, the shorter exposure you could have without having concern for, for damage to your hearing. So, for example, 80 decibels, which many sound machines go way over 80 decibels, but 80 decibels for adults is considered safe for about eight hours of time, not more than that. For children, it's much more conservative. And so, you know, the American Academy of Pediatrics, when they come up with their like safe levels of, of auditory output, you know, uh, they will say, you know, 50, 60, you know, these are the levels that we should be shooting for if you're going to have, you know, a prolonged exposure. And some would say less than 50 if you're like in a nursery environment it is ideal. Uh, I haven't been able to find reliable information or reliable data that says above this level for children for, for eight hours of time is going to cause hearing damage. I, I, so I, I can't give you an exact decibel. All I can say is the lower, the better, and try to keep the, the sound machine far away from your child if you can. And, and try to avoid kind of ups and down mel you know, melodies. Try to have just kind of a continuous noise in the background if you choose to use a white noise machine. I'm a purist, so my preference is always to wean you off of anything that's going to help you fall asleep and try to, try to get children used to falling asleep kind of independent with their own kind of self-soothing mechanisms. Okay, so I'm addicted to my sound machine. <laughs> <laughs> that happens. That happens, Renee. Yeah, I mean, at all ages, you can get addicted. It's funny because many parents say I was not addicted until I started a sound machine for my child, and now I can't fall asleep without it. Your brain learns so quickly. It learns so quickly. It's, yeah, I am obsessed with my sound machine, and I use one that's not like a speaker. It's an actual machine that creates... It's like a fan on the inside and you can like adjust the tone of it. Interesting. So I can't, I can't stand the ones that are like a speaker. It's mm -hmm. just not real. Like I don't like Sounds that Sounds too sound. electronic and artificial to you. Yeah. Yeah. And I remember my sister talking about the research that you're talking about, about the decibel thing. And so I downloaded a little thing on my phone to like measure the decibel of mm -hmm. the sound machine and mine was fine. But now that you say it about kids... I'm after we're done recording, I'm going to go to his room and measure the decibels on that because yeah. I never even thought of that. Yeah, it's, you know, children's hearing, we think is more fragile. Just the anatomy of the ear canal, we think may help amplify sounds for children in a way that doesn't apply to adults. And so, yeah, a lot of things to think about you know, for children. But again, you know, my view is if you can, if, if you need to use it, you know, short periods of time or to help, you know, on a particularly rough night, great. If you're able to wean them off of it, even better. And if you do have to use it, try to use it at the lowest settings possible. Yeah. 
Okay. Do you have any, before I let you go, do you have any just general advice for parents um, and children sleeping? Not necessarily a child that has, you know, a, a certain diagnosis or an issue, but just, you know, they want to get better sleep for the whole family. Like what are some things like your go-to pieces of advice? Yeah. Ha- happy to go through this. And it's tough. We haven't gone through any you know, specifics regarding sl- sleep training approaches, and I'm happy to kind of dive into some of that. But, you know, early on, you know, the first six weeks of life, it is an absolute crap show when it comes to sleep. And that's because your child has no semblance of a circadian rhythm, is going to sleep and awake whenever the heck they want. And you just kind of have to, 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 to hang on, you know, and ask for help, get support wherever you can, and kind of hang on. When your child gets to a certain age, we're usually talking four months and above, and usually the safe age is around six months. At six months, that's when you have the option if your child has become dependent on you know caregiver intervention to help fall asleep and is waking up multiple times at night that's when you can use a behavioral intervention what you know quote unquote we call sleep training you know we we call them behavioral interventions to help with sleep onset associations and in 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 our in our medical world but that's when you can use a sleep training technique you know my go tos people always talk about cry it out and sleep training is cry it out well no you know there are there are really four strategies that actually have data to support them when it comes to sleep training and quiet out is kind of on, on one extreme side of that. Most sleep physicians and, you know, have kind of strayed away from that over time just because although that's safe and effective, you know, it's, uh, we, we just don't like, don't like that approach. If we can, we can try something different. It can be stressful for everybody. Uh, so my usual go-to is one of two things. One is graduated extinction, a.k.a. the Ferber technique or the controlled crying technique where a family, you know, once you do all the great things for your child, you do all your routine, all get all the cuddles in, have a fun, relaxing routine, make sure a child is fed and not hungry. The typical approach here is if your child is six months and otherwise healthy, and we think they have dependency on you to fall asleep, that's when you can use this technique. You put them in the crib, and then you wait for a certain period of time before you run in there and, and try to soothe them to see if they can settle on their own, learn that self-soothing skill. And yes, children can learn how to self-soothe. Children tens of thousands of them are doing it right now. You know, children can learn that skill. Uh, so, you know, it, it involves waiting. The classic is wait five minutes. Uh, if a child is still fussing, pat them for a minute, make sure they understand that you're there, try to calm them, don't take them out of the crib, and then wait for another period of time, like 10 minutes and see if they'll settle. And if they don't, check in again for a minute and then leave and then check in every 15 minutes. The timing of check-in is completely arbitrary. You could say, I'm going to check in every three minutes for my child no problem. You know, as long as you're not decreasing the time interval, as long as you're keeping it steady, you're kind of abiding by it. At some point, your child will fall asleep. And the goal is when they've done that, they've done that independently without you actively being involved. Uh, People say, well, I don't want to leave my kid to cry. And I say, okay, don't, you know, sit right next to the crib called graduate extinction with presence. You can be right there next to your child, like in the room with them. You know, there's so many Mm -hmm. ways that you can modify this technique to ensure that it jives what you want to do as a parent and what you're comfortable with. Um, but that's, but the goal here is helping them learn to kind of self-soothe, um, o- over time. Usually with graduate extinction, if you're sticking with it, you know, I actually have a, a, a playlist on my TikTok account that goes through, like it has 10 videos and it's the very top of my feed. You can just, uh, 10 videos that go through all the techniques and all the kind of the details behind it. So feel free to have that resource totally free. It's all, it's all there for you. Um, these courses will they'll charge you hundreds of dollars, but you know. The information well, out because there on the they can and, you know, because parents are yeah, desperate they're desperate yeah so it's that information yeah. is all there for you other techniques are slower like camping out where you're slowly and gradually weaning your presence over time that doesn't involve that same level of kind of crying and you know uh so it's a slower process but you know l- less crying and so i have details about that technique as well so you know it's it's buried a little bit deeper in my instagram feed but it's all there like the, t- the 10 videos you see like a blue circle in the middle 10 videos that has everything that you need to know about sleep training for kids. Love it. Okay. Well, where can people find you online? What are, what platforms are you on? What's your name and yeah. all that jazz? The, the main ones these days are, are TikTok and Instagram for me, but I'm on everyone. It's, it's that sleep doc. Uh, and uh, I'm on, I'm on Facebook. I'm on YouTube. I'm on X, but mostly TikTok and Instagram. And what about your book? I saw that you have a book. I do have a book that's out there. It's called My Child Won't Sleep. It's meant to be a 50-page, get-to-the-point, fast, step-by-step instructions that go through all the different sleep training techniques. They also Uh. go through two techniques to help with limit setting for toddlers, and it also goes through insomnia for teenagers and delayed sleep-wake phase syndrome, which is a cadence rhythm issue for teenagers, a lot of which also applies to adults. So it's meant to be like, get to the point, you know, 
nobody's got yeah. time to read 400 pages when you're a sleep deprived parent and, and, and find like the two lines that are actually going to help you. I'm like, let me just give you a book that has everything step by step so you can read it in the time a kid naps and then yeah. you're like a mini with, sleep with expert. With no fluff. You know? no, no fluff. No fluff. There's no fluff in this book. <laughs> just hear the techniques, you know, use what works for you. This, this has data to support it. Use what works for you. Again, let me empower you and then you can decide what's best for your family. And it's not like awesome. this is my technique. This is the one technique that I've invented. It's like, these are the four techniques that we know work, you know, based on data. Here you go. Here you have them. Yeah. I love that. Well, thank you so much. I'm so happy that I came. Actually, I didn't come across your TikTok. My, somebody sent it to me and I was like, oh my God, this is the best. I'm so um, thankful you did. Yeah. 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 <laughs> like it's, I had a video like years ago, somebody, I responded to a comment like you did. And it was someone saying something about like, oh, yeah, like, where's your degree and whatever. And I was like, well, actually, here's my <laughs> here's master's. My here's my yeah. PhD. And here's a, it was so funny. So that's why they sent me your video, because it was in the same kind of tone. It's I, just I rarely ever I rarely ever flex as the TikTok folks call it. I rarely ever flex. This is one example of people need to know who you're who you're talking to. You need to understand people's credentials and what their background is. And whether they have any business telling you what you should or shouldn't do for your child, especially when it comes to things like sleep. And so I guess I had to pull a little bit of a flex to that video, but I'm so thankful uh, that you saw it. Um, I love and it. You really helped get the word out regarding my account. And my Instagram following like blew up after you mentioned me. And so thank you. Aww, <laughs> well, I hope we're getting awesome. the message out to more people. So. <laughs> Awesome. Well, this has been great. We'll have to have you back on to maybe we can go in more depth on the sleep training uh, methods or something like that. People love this topic. So happy to. Yeah, we will. We will keep in touch. Well, thank you so much Sounds for great. coming on. Thank you for having me. And I'm on the road.